And, uh, I welcome you all to the last talk of the Invited Lecture program. And it's my pleasure to, to introduce the speaker of this uh, last talk, Henry Segerman. You met him already during the public lecture on, uh, on Tuesday. And uh, I really like the, the work that Harry is doing because it's really a, a very nice mixture of uh, uh, geometry, mathematics, but also art. So uh, also the CV of Harry, who is now currently assistant professor at the Department of Mathematics of Oklahoma State University, his CV, I think, reflects very nicely the achievement that he got in both in, on the theoretical aspect of geometry and also on the artistic side, so with mathematics and printing that you uh, all have seen, but also, let's say, a virtual or visual experience of complex geometry and topologies that will be the subject of the talk today. So, two tales of mathematical virtual reality. Harry, please. Thank you. Thank you, so I'm on this uh, politically depressing uh, morning. I hope we can have a, a more fun experience here today. Um, so, so I'm going to tell you, well, this is really two talks that I have crammed together, but they both come under the heading of uh, doing interesting things uh, related to virtual reality. Uh, so the first talk is about a project uh, I worked on with uh, by heart, Andrew Hawksley and Mark Ten Bosch, who called Hypernon. So, um, so I'll demonstrate it over here. So I have an iPad, and oops, let me uh, fix the orientation, it's important. So as I'm moving the iPad around, uh, we seem to be moving through the space. So the, uh, what's going on here is the orientations of the iPad are controlling my location through space. Um, and I guess I can give a very brief synopsis, which may make sense to um, some people in the audience, uh, and then I'll go through and explain uh, in more detail what's going on. So the orientations of the iPad are, you can represent as three by three uh, matrices. Uh, SO3 has a manifold, SO3 is RP3, which is double covered, so which is double covered by S3. What's being shown on the screen is the projection of S3, the three sphere, and we're navigating through the space using the orientation of the iPad. So okay, that was the very brief, that was the abstract. And now, um, now again, more slowly, uh, perhaps with less notation, what, what's going on. So this is a, it's a virtual reality game or experience that uses a headset or a phone, or in this case an iPad, in an unusual way. So, um, so if you haven't thought about uh, what are the space of orientations of a, an object before, um, well, it's a three-dimensional space. There's a three degrees of freedom uh, in the, the orientation of some objects. You can rotate it, or you can you can yaw to the left or right, you can pitch up and down, and you can roll to the left or right. Um, and so the idea of this, this game or experience, or whatever you want to call it, is to use the orientation of the device uh, to navigate the, the player through a three-dimensional space. So, um, if you haven't thought about this before, um, here's a, a, a good way to imagine the space of all possible orientations of an object. So, um, so let's say we, we've got a sort of home orientation here, uh, and um, all of the other orientations are going to be described in terms of the relation to this home orientation. Um, so I'm going to uh, hopefully convince you that the set of all orientations corresponds to the points of a three-dimensional ball. So I'm going to put my home orientation in the center of the ball here, and I'm going to assign other possible orientations of the device. Oops, it's always a little difficult. Okay, it'll be fine. Um, I'm going to assign other orientations of the device to other points of the ball. So, for example, if I rotate around this axis by 90 degrees, um, then I'm going to assign the to the point in the ball to that orientation um, by moving along the same axis as I'm rotating around by uh, the distance, which is the angle that I've rotated by. So I, so I suppose uh, this, this ball is radius pi because 
by rotating pi over 2, I've moved halfway out to the boundary pole. If I rotate by 180 degrees pi, then I'm up here on the boundary pole. If I rotate the other direction, then I go down uh, along the axis rather than up. So there's a choice of which way you want to go. And if I rotate by pi the other direction, then I get down here. And then the thing to notice is that, okay, well, let's, let's see. So if I rotate by 180 degrees this way, and I rotate by 180 degrees this way, then I end up in the same orientation. So uh, what you're supposed to um, do now is say, well, this point here at the bottom of the ball is the same as this point here at the top of the ball. So I should identify those two together, and I want to describe all of the possible orientations. So, um, so I need to glue opposite points on the boundary of ball, the ball together. Um, and so the space that we get is uh, the real, real projective space, R3. Um, I guess there's one other thing you have to be convinced about um, before you believe that this is really uh, in bijection with all the possible um, orientations of the device, an object, and that's that you can get to any, from any orientation to any other one by choosing an, an axis and by rotating by some angle. But once you believe that, then, uh, then you've got everything. Okay, so, so the space of possible orientations is RP3. Um, uh, you may be uh, more familiar with RP2, the, the real projective plane. Uh, so you use studied surfaces. The way that you make this uh, object is you, you take a, a disk and you glue opposite points of the boundary of the, the two-dimensional disk. So this is an, an analogy with gluing opposite points on the boundary of three dimensional ball. So, um, well, and, and you know, when you're making Mobius strips or Klein bottles, you draw some sort of shape and you put arrows to say how you're identifying and gluing the edges together. And so that's what's going on here. This uh, edge here is supposed to be glued to this edge. Um, so, uh, RP2 is double covered by the two sphere, uh, the ordinary <coughs> sphere of three dimensional space. Um, so, uh, what does that mean? Well, this is a little difficult to, to get into exactly how to think about it, but um, well one, one way to think about it is if I, if I take two copies of this picture, um, and then I, so I've got copy A and copy B, and I glue the corresponding arrows that are supposed to be glued. So, so on this copy, I'm supposed to glue this thing to this thing, but instead I, copy, co I, instead I glue it to the corresponding arrow on the, the other sheet, then when I glue that together, I get the two sheets. So, in wandering around on RP2, I'm also, I can lift that path that I follow to wandering around on the two sphere. And in the same way, RP3 is double covered by the three sphere, the, the sphere of four dimensional space. So, okay, so that sort of hopefully says something about when I'm moving the iPad around, I'm navigating in three dimensional space. Now the question is, what am I drawing on screen? So, um, so I went through this very quickly on, uh, on Tuesday. So I've got a little bit more time now, so I can maybe uh, describe this again. What we want there? Um, what am I drawing on screen? What's, what are all these shapes? So, um, so I'm using stereographic projection to go from a sphere to a flat space. So this picture is how do you get from the two sphere, the ordinary sphere, three dimensional space, to the, the two-dimensional plane, and so stereographic projection, you can, you can either view it as, um, so, well, I, a light ray comes from, from the, the, the flashlight or the torch here, it hits the sphere somewhere, it hits the plane somewhere, and that gives the corresponding screen two. Um, the formula is also very, very nice. Right? I mean, this is about as nice as any kind of uh, thing to implement you could hope for. Um, I should, uh, uh, mention uh, there's one point on the plane that isn't hit um, by this, uh, sorry, there's one point in the sphere that doesn't have a co corresponding point on the plane, and that's the very north pole itself. Um, and so really this is, I guess there's a little bit of a lie here, there should be a plane plus one point at infinity, so if z is equal to one, then, then this plays off. Um, I should also mention this picture and this formula are not quite saying the same thing. Um, this formula will be accurate if the, the table were going through the equator of the sphere rather than the south pole, uh, in terms of the lengths of the, the, 
the, uh, the vectors that you get. Um, but the difference between, well, two things. One, if you put the table at the equator of the sphere, then it's difficult to get a shadow that works properly because you need the light ray to hit the sphere down here before hitting the, the, the plane uh, that goes through the equator of the sphere, which is difficult to arrange. Um, the second thing is that the only difference between this picture and this equation is a factor of two. If you just sort of lift the plane up or down, all you're doing is scaling the image. Okay, so that's two-dimensional stereographic projection. Um, we're going to be doing three-dimensional stereographic projection, um, but well, I haven't described what it is that I'm showing. I'm showing um, uh, I'm showing some of the the, the sides of a four-dimensional regular polytope. Um, so again, we're going to go by analogy with the, the, the situation one dimension down. How would I go about drawing a cube um, in the two-dimensional plane? So I want to show, say, a two-dimensional person who lives in, inside of this plane, a cube, something up here in the third dimension, what do I do? I've got stereographic projection that gets me from the sphere to the plane, but I need to get my cube onto the sphere first. So this picture is supposed to show radial projection from the cube to the sphere. So there's this sort of schematic picture over here, which radially project the, the cube out of the sphere, and then I can stereographically project that to the plane. And then I get some shapes in the plane that are two-dimensional, as you would be able to see. Um, and in the same way, if you do this one dimension up, um, you can show the pictures of the, the, the light and the shadows, and you can show the, the image, the shadow itself, in three dimensions. Um, so this is a hypercube, a four-dimensional regular polytope that I radially projected onto the sphere of four-dimensional space, and then stereographically projected to R3 this time. And again, the formula is, is super nice. Um, uh, it's really nothing to complain about. So this is the, the hypercube. Uh, here's the 120 cells, another one of these four-dimensional regular polytopes. Um, in some way, an analog of the dodecahedron. Uh, and that's what's going on here. So, so the, the, what's being shown here are dodecahedral cells of uh, the 120 cell. Um, and I've just shrunk them in a little bit so that they don't quite touch. So you can see between them, you can see a little bit of the distance uh, where you're going to. So, um, so that's what's going on. Um, oh, so I, sh I should mention what's the, the aim of the game. So when you get close to a dodecahedron, it disappears, you eat it. Um, so this is sort of four-dimensional Pac-Man. Um, the aim of the game is to eat all of the cells, uh, and, and that's where the name comes from. Hyper non, so the hyper is in hypersphere. The norm as in non, non, non. <laughs> so the aim of the game is to eat all of the dodecahedra, which is achieved by getting your iPad to every possible orientation twice because of the double cover. Um, so okay, so how do you? Well, you could just start playing around and try and um, try and understand what is the connection between the movements that you make here and what you're seeing on the screen. Um, it's actually quite understandable. So um, it turns out that so if I were to, so I'm going to I'm going to like, turn a steering wheel to the right, and when you do this, you go um, forwards. And in fact, what what appears to happen is that you move along the axis that your device is rotating at. So when I rotate like this, I go forwards. When I rotate like this, I go backwards. It gets a little confusing because there's things wrapping around infinity. So let me, oh yeah, so, so here's all of the other polytopes. We can use the, um, the 24 cell if we want, or the 600 cell. Um, so let's go back to the 120 cell. So there you go. Um, <coughs> And so let me actually just show you um, this, uh, this double cover fact. You can, you can really see it kind of directly. So, so here I am, I'll just, I'll just restart. So I've got all of my cells, and I'm going to rotate by 360 degrees this way. So that's 180, 360. And you can see that I'm not back where I started. If I were back where I started, then I would be seeing cells that I'd eaten already. But if I go another 180 degrees and 360 degrees, you can, you can see the tunnel that I've, tun I, I've tunneled out uh, a great circle through the, the three sphere. 
Um, and so this is really showing the, the, the double cover feature. Let me unwind this. Whenever I do this talk, and my iPad connects it to a cable, which records the movements of my, or at least the twists that I look at here. So, so I wanted to, before sort of moving on from, from this, uh, this part of the talk, I wanted to highlight a, a really beautiful relationship between the three-dimensional dodecahedron and the 120 cell, and this, uh, this matching between the rotations of a device and moving through the three scale. And so this is, um, this is sort of an instruction manual, how do we evolve the cells of the 120 cell? Um, and, uh, uh, and so really this is saying, where are the cells of the 120 cell? And it turns out that the positions of them are in some sense the same as the symmetries of the dodecahedron. So, so here's a here's a dodecahedron. I've, I have drawn in axes for the different kinds of rotation you can do that uh, are symmetries of the dodecahedron, so that leave the dodecahedron looking the same as <coughs> you've done the motion. So, so I'm going to say, where are all of these these cells? So, so there's let's say there's one cell in the middle. So when I when I start the whole thing again, I'm sitting inside of one cell with a 12 dodecahedron around me. Um, and this is sort of a schematic picture down here of the, the, the three sphere. And so I'm going to stereographically project from this point at the north pole of the three sphere. And the, the dodecahedron in the middle is right at the south pole. So, what are the closest dodecahedra to, the, to this one dodecahedron at the south pole? Well, they correspond to the smallest rotations that you can do that leave the dodecahedron looking the same. And so those are rotations by uh, a fifth of a turn, 2 pi over 5, around one of these axes that go through two faces of the dodecahedron. And so how many of those rotations are there? Well, there are six such axes because you need to choose um, uh, two opposite pentagonal faces of the dodecahedron. But you can rotate by a fifth of a turn either to the left or to the right. So that gives you 12 possible rotations, which are the smallest, and those correspond to 12 dodecahedra of the 120 cell, which are as close as possible to the one that you started with. The next closest uh, symmetries of the dodecahedron are the rotations by 2 pi over 3 uh, around these axes of the threefold symmetry. And those correspond to the dodecahedra that are uh, 2 pi over 3 distance away from the central one in uh, uh, in the, in the three scale. Um, so again, you can do the count. How many of these are there? Well, how many um, axes are there? So there are 20 vertices on the dodecahedron. So 10 axes, because you have to go in pairs. But because you can go pi over 3 in either direction, that gets you back to 20 uh, of these yellow dodecahedra, which are near to that. Then the next ones are these rotations by 2 pi over 5. Again, there are 12 of those. And then we get to the equator of the three sphere. Uh, these are the symmetries corresponding to rotation by pi around uh, the midpoints of edges. There are 30 edges, so there are 15 axes that you can rotate around. You can go either way, so that gets you back to 30, but again, well, now we're running up against the difference between RP3 and S3 again. So there are only 15 ways to rotate uh, a dodecahedron by 180 degrees, but um, because of the double cover, we see 30 of them. On the equator. And um, if you continue on building out what you see here, there are 120. You can add up all of the numbers and see you get the right answer. And you get all these, uh, the, the, the pattern sort of repeats in reverse. Going down down. So this is how they eat all of the cells of the 120 cell. I, I won't uh, attempt to win the game on stage right now. Um, as I said, this was originally developed for uh, uh, VR headsets. Quite difficult to, to win if it's attached to your face rather than to an iPad. There's some very difficult orientations to get. Um, so this will work, should work on, on your iOS or your Android smartphone. Uh, just go to hyphenon.com and it will load immediately. Um, you'll want to lock the orientation of your screen, otherwise it's, it's very confusing to, to, to work. Uh, the paper is um, online and the source code is at GitHub. So, um, Maybe that means I should get one of those, those fancy R symbols. This source is all there. OK, so that was the first talk, the Python on. Uh, let me move on to the second uh, talk. So
So I need a little bit of setup just to switch over. Um, so to do this, so, so I'm talking about um, spherical cameras, sometimes called 360 cameras, although I think that uh, is not a good name. It should be uh, spherical cameras because it's recording a sphere of data around it. So let's see if I can get this working. Um, Hopefully work. There we go. So this is um, so there's me in real time being recorded on this spherical um, camera. And so what's going on here? You've got a, uh, a can't see both lens at the same time. Maybe if I do this, there we go. So there's a there's a lens over here and there's a lens over here, and together they see everything. So a whole sphere of data around. So what is this useful for? Well, it's a different medium, right? It's a, it's a, it's a different kind of thing from, from ordinary flat video. Um, and there's some obvious um, applications. Video conferencing, no longer will somebody walk out of frame on Skype and you can't see what they're doing anymore because there's no frame. You can just follow them. Um, so here's a, a, a photograph that I took a couple of days ago of the lobby of the, the hotel. Um, so what comes out of the camera is, well, when you transfer it or you upload it somewhere, or you edit it in some image and processing program, you're editing the echo rectangular projection. So this is two by one rectangle, um, which is the data of the sphere on rats latitude longitude. Um, now that's maybe not so, well, this is certainly an interesting viewpoint, but you can also, so this is the app that comes with the uh, it's a freely downloadable application that comes, it's associated with the camera, and you can use this to pan around and see what's going on. Um, so, I mean, here's another application. If you're ever doing some sort of project in the location, architectural thing, um, this is fantastic for recording what's going on in the location. If you didn't remember to count how many windows are there across the front of the lobby, then you just load up your photograph and you, and you just look. Whereas if you were going around with a flat camera, Maybe you forgot to, you didn't get that in shot. But this is it's fantastic for recording everything that's going on. Okay, so, um, so that's what's coming out of the camera. Um, so I've, I got interested in um, transformations that you might want to do with spherical data. So, um, so this is going to be my test image that I'm going to use for most of the, the things that I'm going to be talking about. Um, this is. Um, some of you may know uh, Vi Hart, uh, Andrea Hawksley, both mathematical artists. Um, Vi Hart, Emily, uh, Andrea Hawksley, and Emily Eiffel work on uh, virtual reality video and uh, other research things to do with virtual reality. And uh, there were two copies of each of us in this scene because I did some Photoshop to it to make it more interesting. Um, and here's the the in-sphere view of the same thing. So we're in their office in San Francisco. Um, so this image appears in all my talks. Um, what are we going to do with this sphere of data to transform it? We want to turn it into complex numbers. So uh, again, we use stereographic projection, but instead of going to the plane, I'm going to go to the Riemann sphere, to the complex plane plus the point of infinity. Same formula here. Um, and one side, so here's another picture of that stereographic projection. So I've got this sphere of image data here, and I'm projecting it onto the plane, and now I can apply all kinds of functions to it. Um, so for example, I can scale the, the plane. I know how to scale uh, the, the complex plane. I just multiply by 2, um, and I get a new image, and I put it back onto the sphere using stereographic projection <laughs> again. And this will have some effect on what the scene looks like. Um, so maybe yeah, so this is this is the effect of what, what you get. So if I go back from here to here, you'll see that everything's sort of moved up, or we've zoomed towards the floor. So this is a kind of zoom in um, spherical video. So here's the here's the image you can see looking around. The ceiling looks much further away, uh, the floor is much bigger, it feels like I'm lower down. So, this is not so obvious, this was one of the things I was interested in. Zoom, it's obvious how to do zoom in flat images, 
how do I do zoo and circle images? What does that mean? And I think this is the right answer, um, or at least a right answer. I just want to make a comment about um, the title here. So the natural way to think about what this operation is, here's the original image, and I'm scaling everything up by two. But in terms of the curve, you always want to pull back by the inverse function. So in order to generate this scaled image, what I do is I look at all the pixels there, and then I apply some function to those pixel locations, and they give me locations on the sphere, which I then take the colors from the original image. So everything's sort of backwards. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so with, with vector images and so on, you, you, you can push things forward with pixel images, and you tend to want to pull things back. It's a more efficient way to do things. OK, here's another operation I could do. So I don't need to just uh, scale by uh, linear. Uh, well, I don't need to just multiply by some number. I can also uh, square the complex numbers. And what happens, so again, this is the difference between pulling back and pushing forwards. Um, so if I pull back by the maps z goes to z squared, then this is sort of like square rooting the image. So um, let's see if I can. So, so here's phi. And she, so that's, that's supposed to be uh, the real axis is along here. And maybe phi is at uh, 45 degrees. So, um, no, sorry, not at 45 degrees. Phi, phi is at about i. So here's, here's 0 degrees, here's 90 degrees. So, so phi is uh, i on the complex plane. And here I've applied square roots. So there are two square roots of i. There's one here at 45 degrees. And there's another here at uh, 180 plus 45 degrees. <laughs> and this is what you get. Um, so this is an unwrapped uh, picture. And what you get is remarkably natural looking. I, I mean, it's the case that there's two copies of everything. And if you look up at the ceiling, there's this interesting, well, there's a branch point here. So when you, when you do these sort of unwrapping things, you get these points where locally you see uh, everything twice. Um, but because all the all the transformations are conformal, it's very natural. So here's a, a, a video that I um, so I upgraded to a two-fold branch cover of my apartment. So if you look around, you can see well, there's a lot of space. Um, if you look straight up, so uh, I'll I'll talk over myself. So so this is uh, done with a little bit of trickery. Um, so I've cloned out the copy of me that's supposed to be over there. And uh, I have two coffee tables, but only one of them has my book. And I have two couches, but only one of them has my laptop. Um, and I can um, walk around from one leaf of the, the, the branch cover of my apartment to the other one, pick up my laptop, and then I can go back and, and collect my book from the other uh, part of the branch cover. Um, here's, a, here's another uh, video that uses. This is actually more interesting uh, in the unwrapped echo rectangular version than in the, the spherical version. Also this. Um, so here's here's the, the, the flat unwrapped version. That's this very interesting fact that everybody's facing forwards. Uh, and we just appear to be throwing clubs to the side. So we do various patterns. Um, it's very interesting symmetrical. This is this symmetrical panels. This was recorded at Stanford University. If you've ever been to the, the quad at Stanford? This is, it was a very rainy day a few months ago. Um, but halfway through, here we go. Uh, here's just what happens when you when you pull back by z goes to z squared. Now there are six jugglers rather well, than three. Uh, I'll do the same thing. So um, let me move on to another class of interesting transformations. So uh, there's an effect called the, the Droste effect, which is named after uh, this Dutch brand of cocoa powder. Um, and, and the Droste effect is the effect of a, an image that contains itself. So um, I guess the, the, the packaging is famous for having a smaller version of the packaging on it, which has a smaller version of the packaging on it, and so on. So um, how do you construct these kinds of pictures? So the, the, the general scheme, I think, that a good way to think about it is to think about a certain annulus. 
So I'll call this the Droster annulus. This is all the data that you need to reconstruct such a recursive picture. So I've deleted the, the bit that gets, gets copied, and I'm going to scale everything and put it inside of there. I'm going to repeat this many times. So here's a, a Droster annulus for my canonical image. I've removed the center of the, the, the screen, the, this frame, and I've also cut off at the edges with some kind of frame. And I have to do that in order to decide how I'm going to fit whatever else is left inside of the, the internal frame. So the mathematically nice way to produce one of these zooming uh, log, uh, zooming uh, recursive pictures is to take log. So if I apply log, or if you prefer full band by complex exponential map, then what happens is that angle is, is unwrapped into the imaginary axis, and scaling is, uh, becomes the, the real axis. So this repeats after a vertical distance of 2 pi. And you can see there's this sort of scalloped edge here for the edge of the, the, the frame. And then here's the, the edge what we're going to, uh, well, the, the boundary around here. So then I tile this picture horizontally. I just take lots and lots of copies and just infinitely tile um, horizontally. And then I apply the exponential map. But you may notice, by the way, these little dots down here, they tell me how many of the frames on the other thing to go through. It's, it's very confusing having to have two different sets of frames that you have to know anyway. Um, so I need to do four, uh, four here. So, OK, so here's the, um, wait, is this the right one? No, this is something else. Uh, well, it's very confusing. I may have gone out of sequence. Okay, I'm not sure why that was there, but okay, I think we're, yes, yeah, so we're back at the standard picture, and there's the, the Droster version. So I just replaced the inside with all of those other copies. Now, this setup allows us to answer a question um, that I'd always wondered. If you're inside of a Droster picture, a recursive picture, what happens if you turn around and look at this? Well, this is what happens. There's this strange portal floating in the middle of the room. And it looks like a flower. I was very surprised by this. I, I thought there'd be another square frame on the other side. There isn't. There's this, there's this sort of flower shape. And, sort of, and I can attempt to explain why it has to be this shape. Well, everything's conformal. The angles have to be preserved when you do these <coughs> zooming translations. So there's a, well, this would be a right angle here apart from the perspective distortion. But this angle here has to be repeated here. And we're outside of this frame, but we're inside of the frame here, and the angle is the same, so we have to be inside that angle. And the straight lines here, or arcs of circles, have to be arcs of circles here. So that's why that's there. Um, I mean, so as I was saying, my name is Henry Sagan. This is a spherical Droster video. So you're sort of slowly zooming this way, or rather the frame here is coming over you this way, uh, and over there there's a sort of weird pedal portal in the middle of my apartment. This is the future, so there's future versions of me over there, um, and this is the past. Uh, so I'll hand you off to a past version of me uh, to explain again what's going on. A past version of me. So, as I was saying, my name is Henry Sagan. This is a spherical <laughs> Droster video. So, so the video loops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so there's a little extra trick here. I don't have to put the same thing through the window. Um, so what's through the window is offset in time 30 seconds to the past. So by the time I get there by zooming through the window, I've got back to the start of the video. It continues again. Um, let's see. Here's another variant. So, so this now has two zoom directions and two portals. Um, this is kind of... Uh, never quite uh, know what's going to happen. So with the smaller screen, because I'm plugged in, I can't get to the pause button. So we're just going to have to do this with it moving. Um, so there's a window frame here. This is the, the window of my apartment. And on the floor, well, there's a, there's a large circular mirror that's sitting on a coffee table. And the other end of the, the, other end of the, the, the apartment window is up here above the couch. And the other end of the uh, mirror is up here. <coughs> Let's see, am I going to get to the right thing now? No, I'm not. 
we'll get to that. Okay, so what happened is that somehow these are going to work. Right, so, oh, I know what happened. I forgot to talk about this ages ago. So, um, this is another variant. Oh, wait, no, no, I'll get that one. Sorry. Here we go. So, we, we were talking about z goes to z squared. Here's a, another variant um, where the branch point is actually of infinite order. You know, infinite many copies of the room behind you. Um, this this is, uh, comes from pulling back by a function related to the exponential function. Okay, let's go forward again. This, that's nice. Okay. So um, the very famous example of this, the Stoster effects is uh, uh, due to Escher. Um, this is not Escher's picture. Um, uh, a few uh, few years ago, maybe a decade ago, uh, Barbara Smith and Henrik Lenstra figured out how to fill in the hole in the middle of, of Escher's print tracheotomy. Um, and so I'll uh, tell you what's going on with that. We do the same thing with spherical images. So here's this, uh, this uh, unwrapped, the, the log version of the Droster annulus again. And this is it tiled out, but what I've done is I've highlighted this rectangle here, which is on its top. So the idea with the twisted version of, of these pictures is that you're supposed to um, not use this as this direction as the imaginary direction. If you rotate and you scale appropriately, then you use this direction as the imaginary direction. You can see that this point here down here is the same as this point here. So after rotating and scaling appropriately, you still have repetition in the vertical direction, which means that you can apply the exponential map, you can pull back by log, and you get uh, this. So it's the same sort of thing, except you're mixing up uh, the rotation part with the scaling part because you're rotating the log picture. So that is what's going on here. So same sort of thing that this, uh, the, the frame follows uh, approximately a logarithmic, uh, loxodromic spiral atmosphere. Um, let's see where I am. I'll turn off the board for this. So this is, this is a, another variant. This, is, um, this was filmed at um, uh, Alexa Mead and Chris Hughes, a uh, Los Angeles-based artist. Um, and this was filmed at their house. Um, this is a different kind of untwisting where there are uh, two, two, you untwist two times for every one time you zoom through, and uh, we get this interesting spiral staircase effect. And again, um, various copies of us are cloned out so that you only see one copy of us and the cat. So, um, what other kinds of things, other kinds of interesting maps can you do? So, um, so I should mention this, this, this whole uh, half of the talk is joined by Saul Schleimer, uh, so a collaborator of mine at the University of Warwick. Um, so there's this uh, uh, function, that, the, the y strass p function, there are different versions of, uh, of this. This one is uh, for a square lattice, um, and well, uh, you add up infinitely many uh, terms of this, of this kind with uh, Gaussian integers w, uh, not far. Well, and the prime here says w0. Um, and it turns out that this function um, is doubly periodic. So if you uh, add 1 uh, to a complex number, you get the same thing. If you add i to a, com to a complex number, you get the same thing. So unlike um, log or exponential, whichever way you want to be able to say it, after you take log, the image that you get repeats vertically. With this one, the image that you get repeats both horizontally and vertically. So we should be able to do some other kind of twisting uh, transformation to uh, take an image into the, the unwrapped world, twist, and then take back uh, to the, the, the unwrapped world. Um, so since it's got this, uh, this structure, really you can see that the image is, is going to repeat vertically and horizontally. So you can think of it as being, uh, um, well, uh, you can think of it as pulling back up to the torus rather than to the complex plane. So that's sort of what we're trying to illustrate here. So here's the original image on a sphere, and here's a torus uh, patterned with two copies of, of uh, the image on the sphere, and we pull back from, well, so uh, 
the y stress p function goes from, we can think of it as mapping from the torus to the sphere, and you get the, the, the square, the, the unwrapped image of as well. This is what you get when you pull back uh, the spherical image. So just to try and give an intuitive sense of what this map is doing. So if you take the torus, and I, I've got this sort of skewer going down through it, and um, what I wanted, so this is a, another twofold uh, cover, in this case, the twofold branch cover from the torus down to the sphere. So you're supposed to think of, of folding up the torus by rotating half of it around this axis. Well, another, way to, you, another way you can think about it is uh, if I slice it down here, I'm going to get two circular boundaries, and I glue this circular boundary to itself, I glue this circular boundary to itself. The images have to match up because um, I've got this twofold rotational symmetry around here. Um, and once you've done this, you, you've taken half of the torus and closed up the gaps. Topologically, you have a sphere, and, well, this is the picture that you get, and these red dots here are the, the images of the four points uh, where you've uh, rotated around. Um, we're certainly not the first to have thought about applying this to spherical imagery. Um, Charles Sanders Pierce uh, used this uh, exact same map from 1879 as a proposal for a, a different map of the Earth. Um, I don't think that he put it on a torus, but we did. Um, I mean, he's got a toroidal Earth here. Uh, here's our version, um, wrapped, onto the, well, wrapped onto the Earth. Let's see if I've got it. There we go. This is the, um, this is a 3D version of the same thing. Um, and you can see there's the front side and the back side are the same. It's the same uh, picture. And I've got a hole in it through the middle. And you can see that uh, there's this rotational symmetry around there. And it's, it's the, the, the two-fold branch cover is going through. And let's see, do I want to? This version, you can actually go inside, uh, see what it's like inside of the toroidal earth. Oops. Um, and there's a, of course, I had to make a 3D print of it, so. Um, I guess I'll, I'll hand one thing around today. I've only got one 3D print for this. You can explore this toroidal earth. Okay. So, so I, I was mentioning untwisting. So, um, so here's the, the square tile that I made, and I, I've tiled four and a bit copies of, of that. And so the same idea, if I, if I scale up my picture by one plus i, or divide by one plus i, whichever one it is, then I can take this square as the square I'm going to map down again, instead of the original square. And when I do that, I get this. Um, so the inverse of this uh, Weierstrass p function is, is uh, turns out, we want to use the scorch Christoffel map. So, so this is the, the composition of uh, pullback by a Weierstrass p function scale, and then pullback by a scorch Christoffel map. For implementation purposes, this is not so good. So, but it turns out, um, once you've done this, you have only two uh, branch points. We have a finite number of branch points. Any conformal map with a finite number of branch points. Um, is equivalent to some um, rational function. So this is the one we use for actually implementation of small faster. Let's see what this looks like. Um, here we go. So uh, two couches, the square frame is turned into an octagon, and there's two copies of everything. Um, this isn't actually as different as um, from previous things that we've seen. So the z goes to z squared map, that was unwrapping twice around the ceiling to floor axis, and all this is doing is unwrapping twice around the, the frame to back wall to back wall axis. So this is maybe not that interesting. Um, but instead of scaling by one plus i, you can scale by other complex numbers. Any Gaussian integer um, should give you something interesting. So here, it's just scaling up by two, we get uh, we get this kind of effect. Towards so now this is getting more interesting, of course. Um, so there's a two-fold branch cover on the ceiling. There's another one on the, the, uh, in the frame. The, the back wall and the floor 
somewhere, maybe. Maybe not. Anyway, well now there are, there are a lot of copies of, uh, of everybody. Oh, I thought there would be a, a default match cover before, but apparently not in this one. Um, and here, this is the last one I'll show is uh, scaled by 2 plus i. And this gets very strange. So um, let's go look. So now there are five copies of everybody. We've got the, the ceiling, this two bench, two-fold bench cover of the ceiling here and here, but not there. So sometimes parts of the image are unreacted, and sometimes they aren't. Um, this gets uh, quite sort of confusing and possible geometry feel to it. So this is a video I made trying to sort of take advantage of this. Uh, this is with um, Andrea Hawksley uh, climbing down the outside of this playground castle. So we we chose the we chose to do this so that so here's a two-fold branch cover, sorry, a two-fold branch point on the floor, and there's another one sort of in the undergrowth here. And there's another one in the sky. But there's also one underneath the bridge of this um, uh, castle. So the idea was, well, we can wander around, up and around, the different paths through the space, and can we get to all five branches of this new world? So it has this sort of impossible geometry feel to it, um, very sort of Escher-like. So, we were talking about the, um, the, the wireless trans uh, uh, p function with the, uh, with the square version of it getting the square torus. There's also a version that gives a hexagonal torus. And again, you can see that you know, these, these things will glue up. Um, the opposite sides of the, the hexagon glue up, and that gives you a, a different uh, geometry on the torus. Um, again, you can scale uh, and uh, take a larger chunk of it, and this time we get this threefold branch cover. So I should mention, um, so to find the composition, there, there, there is a, um, a, a difficult um, way to do this, um, but we sort of cheated. Um, we just need to know what are the, there's some rational function that will give us this composition of uh, these various difficult to compute uh, functions and then the scaling and then the inverse of it. Um, so we just take a, so a, a collection of points, see where they go, and then you use uh, Singular value decomposition trick to, to tell you what the coefficient should be. So that's what we ended up doing. Um, so, Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. So, I just wanted to show a couple of other unusual location. Because the location. I'm going to talk over myself again. Um, so, so, I took this uh, at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. This is an extremely symmetrical location. And it's, it's a location where you can get to the center of symmetry. I don't know of many locations as well that are like this, but you can see that, well, it looks very symmetrical. So in a moment, I'm going to uh, demonstrate this symmetry using video tricks. So if I reflect the entire scene onto itself, then the legs match up, of course, the, the background in images, and I don't match up with myself because uh, I'm not that symmetrical. Um, and then in a second, I'm going to do a, a rotation. So I, I don't know, I guess underneath the Eiffel Tower would be another location that would work like this. If anybody knows of any locations in the world which have rotational but not also reflectional symmetry, I'd really like to know. Um, or just other examples. Eiffel Tower gives you uh, D4 symmetry, this is D8 symmetry, what else can you do? Uh, here I'm, I'm unwrapping the sphere. So you used to have eight legs and now when you sort of wrap it around itself, this is pulling back by square root function. So I've got four legs. Um, I'm going to do it again in a second. Wrap it onto itself one more time. So now, well, two more times. Now so I've got two legs. And of course we can't stop there. Now there's only one leg. That's how it zooms away. It's, it's, it's sort of a power of eight going on in the, what's happening to the images. Um, 
here's a, here's a different trick. This is using, also there's a mirror here. This is a very strange mirror. You notice the, the picture on the wall, the mirror is on the same wall, but that picture appears in the mirror. Um, so, well, what did I do? So this is, uh, it's lucky I found a circular mirror, because when I do the appropriate transformations, I can put that circle on the, um, I can put that circle on the real axis, and then I can just conjugate it, and that gets me a reflection. Um, so this was a story here, of something about mirror writing. Um, so I, was, I wouldn't have been able to do this with any other shaped mirror, because I don't have a nice conformal map. Uh, well, so what would happen? So the frame of the mirror has all of these right angles, and then when you flip it, you just, you, it doesn't fit in. Now, of course, the Riemann mapping theorem says that you can fit any disk onto any other disk conformally. And I'm sure somebody here has some very fast algorithm doing this to imagery. So I would like to talk to you about mapping inside of the square mirror by doing some sort of uh, conformal map from one to the other. Here's the last video I'm going to show. This is um, a very interesting effect. Um, something strange is going on with the perspective of my room. So what's happening here um, is you can see that there are these three markers. There's a red marker and a green marker and a blue marker on the walls of my room. Uh, one of the features of Mobius transformations, the, the, some, some of the simplest uh, uh, complex functions you can, you can use, so, so the zoom and rotation and so on use Mobius transformations. One of the features is that they're three transitive, which means that if I give you three distinct points on the sphere, and three target distinct points on the sphere, then you can map from one to the, there's a unique Mobius transformation that maps these three points to those three points. So what I'm doing here is I'm nailing these three points to the wall, or to the wall of the sphere. I just make sure that wherever, well, wherever they are in a frame of the video, I just move them back to where they should be, or where they were in the first frame of the video. Um, this is another thing which I don't have a great solution for. Color only works when you have a very monochrome room. Really, I should be doing this with augmented reality tags and computer vision. Um, I don't have a good system for um, recognizing tags uh, that works in Python. So if anybody has um, uh, a sort of turnkey solution for, here's, a, here's an image, tell me if you see this uh, augmented reality tag, uh, then please let me know. Okay, I think that's all, of course. That's not what I want to do. That's all I have to say. Uh, let's just check if I don't have another video. Now, we're back to you. So, uh, thank you very much. This is, um, there's a lot of videos here on YouTube. If you have a phone, with, which you, in the YouTube app on the phone, you can view all of these things just by using the gyroscope on the phone to look around. Uh, the paper is on the archive. Some of the source code, uh, where I'm still sort of working on all this stuff, and this code is kind of messy, is on GitHub. So, thank you very much.